Hey everyone, uh, my name's Lucas. I'm a software engineer working on a project called GVisor, which is an application kernel and OCI compliant runtime for sandboxing containers. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, cloud native workloads, how. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, talk about sandboxing as a security layer for cloud native workloads, how this fits into the AI language model, machine learning world we find ourselves in. So first I'll start, um, introduce sandboxing as a concept. Might be a little bit of review for some of you. Then we'll look at a couple different approaches to sandboxing and comp compare them. After that I'll go a little bit deeper into the implementation of GVisor specifically, what I work on, and then I'll talk about some of this AI specific stuff and how sandboxing can be a really critical part of the security story of these kinds of workloads. So an important question to ask right out the gate is why do we even need this? Uh, isn't cloud native security complicated enough? What benefit are we gonna get? Uh, I'll try to explain, like I said before, it might be a bit of review, but just bear with me. Uh, so as we may or may not know, containers are really just abstracted kernel environments that use features like namespaces, C groups, pivot roots, and such to give a process some sense of isolation. In a lot of ways, this isolation is very real. You're not gonna be able to access some other uh, container's mountain namespace from a separate one. And this is great, but when you combine this with the fact that um, every uh, container, or many containers, are gonna share the same uh, node, or VM, or host machine, or what have you, uh, and that host machine is gonna have one kernel providing isolation for each of these containers, and when you combine this with the fact that the kernel, unfortunately, has bugs and vulnerabilities, and new ones are discovered every single day. And although there are lots of really talented people who work really hard to uh, patch and backport fixes and all that great stuff, it's a huge attack surface and there's a lot of code and the surface area is massive and your uh, containers are gonna have basically full access to it um, the whole time. And then finally the last nail, uh, nail in the coffin is basically once you have a container scape or a bug that escalates to the category of a vulnerability, then you're basically owned. All the containers that share the kernel um, are all vulnerable, They're gonna, uh, your attacker is gonna have access to everything. You're gonna own all the containers running on that host. Any sensitive data is gonna be fully exposed. So like I said, unsandbox container runtimes like Run C, expose your container to the threat of uh, vulnerabilities in a shared kernel with multiple containers running on the same host. And this threat is very real, it's constant, and by some measures it's growing. Um, one such measure is Syscaller. Syscaller is an open source uh, kernel Fuzzing tool developed by Google, but it runs continuously in the open, uh, posting on a dashboard all these random C programs that it executes, uh, it generates and crashes the kernel in various different ways. It posts these findings for everyone to see, so these bugs are really easy to find. And um, like I said, although there are lots of uh, great people working hard to fix these issues constantly, the sheer volume of the issues that come up uh, make it so that kernel developers can't possibly address all of them. And, and the reality is we can't just ignore this, this problem. We need to run containers that are going to be inherently scary, that are inherently gonna pose risk to underlying systems. Software in the real world is going to have to handle untrusted user-generated content, whether that's parsing, storing, or running it. It's, we're gonna have to work with sensitive data. Uh, maybe you're working with financial or healthcare data or have strict data retention uh, regulations or policies. Everybody has to run third-party code unless you're a very special organization um, not everyone can audit and physically know every single line of code that you're, that you're running. And related to that, we all have to mitigate this uh, supply chain risk. So everybody has probably more dependencies than they want to have. Each of those dependencies is going to carry um, its own set of security risks. Uh, the good news is that, at least for GVisor, though I imagine this extends to uh, other ways of sandboxing as well, the data we have show that the sandboxing really works. So our internal tracking of, of vulnerabilities show that GVisor protected against almost every pod to guest escalation in the past several years. So in summary, the kernel is a huge attack surface that's known to be buggy, unfortunately, uh, that we depend on to isolate containers from each other that run on the same host. Uh, we need to run containers that do inherently scary things, that pose risk to other containers on our host system, and sandboxing is a proven way uh, to mitigate this risk. And so to, just to emphasize this point, uh, here are all the uh, kernel bugs found it by Syscaller in the past few years, sorted by month and category. And like I mentioned before, all it takes is one of these to rise to uh, a vulnerability for all containers on the host to be faced with the real threat that you're gonna have to have an answer for. Uh, 
So I'll just show this diagram right now uh, so we have a good reference of what the unsandboxed security model is. And we'll build on this sort of throughout the uh, presentation. But basically, you have your application. It runs maybe in a pivot route, some C group limits, maybe a limited capability set, um, its own user and mount namespaces, et cetera. Um, but other than that, you have full access to the uh, kernel user space ABI, all the syscalls like MMAP, right? Uh, get paid, all that stuff, um, syscalls, proc files, all that great stuff that you'd expect in a, in a Linux uh, environment. And so hopefully at this point you can agree that there are many cases where sandboxing is, can be a critical part of the security story. Uh, now I want to get under the hood and, and talk about a little bit of how it actually works. Where do we get that uh, security from a sandbox? Where does the, this extra magic come from that prevents those pod to guest escalations? And so to answer that, I'm going to dive into two of the most popular ways to sandbox, um, micro VMs and application kernels. There are a lot of other ways to sandbox, like unikernels. Uh, maybe you've heard of them. I just won't have time to get into that today. But uh, micro VMs and uh, application kernels are two of the most popular methods. So first, I want to talk about micro VM-based sandboxes. Uh, the most popular implementation of this approach is a piece of software called Kata. Uh, Firecracker is also really popular. It's a hypervisor that's uh, created with a focus to make this uh, approach as performant and lightweight as possible. And the idea here basically is just you take each of your pods and run them in their own VM. So the isolation and security comes from the fact that you're no longer sharing that host kernel across all your containers on your um, host machine. So the kernel is no longer shared. You no longer have direct access to host resources. Any uh, exploit or breakout, you're soon to be just uh, isolated and jailed in that micro VM. And now let's look at the uh, application kernel approach, which is what GVisor is. So GVisor, like I said, is an application kernel, which basically just means it's a kernel that runs in user space rather than in ring zero with uh, kernel privileges. So GVisor is a process just like any other process, scheduled by the kernel, runs in a namespace, C group limits. Um, the way it provides security is really with, with two layers of defense. So when you issue syscalls that you expect to go to the host kernel, instead of them being um, handled by the, by the kernel in the host, it, GVisor intercepts those syscalls and redirects them to what we call the GVisor sentry. The GVisor sentry is uh, just our implement, what we call our implementation of the Linux syscall ABI. Um, this sentry is written in Go, memory safe language. That eliminates a few uh, categories of bugs. And the sentry itself, to do work on behalf of the application, of course, may need to reach out to the host kernel itself. Um, for mapping memory, maybe doing um, parallelism, all that great stuff. And so for their second layer of defense, we have a strict um, layer of seccomp filters. Seccomp filters are basically, you can think of them as a whitelist of what syscalls are allowed to be made to the host kernel and uh, what arguments are allowed to be in those syscalls. So there's two layers of defense here. And again, the security comes from the fact that we're no longer sharing that host kernel across our, uh, across our containers. And so here's a general summary of the trade-offs between the two approaches. So where GVisor or the application kernel approach really shines is on the sort of lightweight front. It's super quick to start up. Basically, the overhead is just the overhead of starting any other process on Linux. And the resource footprint is uh, relatively low. So it can run anywhere, just like your, any statically compiled Go binary can run. Um, compare that back to the application, uh, to compare that, sorry, to the micro VM approach where you're going to need a lot more sort of memory and CPU dedicated to hosting a whole uh, VM. And so it's going to take a lot longer to start up that VM and build that. And um, uh, just to go back again to the application kernel appro approach, um, where it tends to show its weakness is any syscall or IO heavy application. So just by nature, uh, all these uh, syscalls are going to incur the maximum syscall interception overhead. Um, and then there's going to be also some overhead just by nature of um, being those syscalls being uh, di uh, implemented in a GC language, right? The, another weakness of the application kernel approach is like uh, there may be just par portions of the Linux user space ABI that aren't implemented in GVisor yet, right? So the GVisor team is a small team and the, a lot of people working on the kernel all the time. Um, we sort of operate in the principle of 80% of these um, programs are using 20% of the syscalls, but of course, there's people need to do weird stuff all the time, <laughs> right? Uh, 
Um, so in the uh, microkernel or uh, micro VM approach, sorry, performance once you overcome uh, that slower startup time compared to the application kernel is going to be much closer to native because you're running that uh, you're running that same kernel. But there can be some pitfalls, right? So uh, there can be steady state. Um, there can be a significant steady state performance degradation uh, with nested virtualization. So if you're already running in a VM and you need to use another uh, layer of virtualization for that micro VM to provide that isolation, you're going to see a really big uh, performance hit. Some cloud providers provide bare metal, but again, you'll have, to, you'll have to pay for that. So now that we have a general survey of sandboxing, I want to dive deeper into how GVisor specifically works. So we're going to look at two parts of the sandboxing. First is the syscall interception and redirection. And the second, we'll take a quick tour through some code to get a rough idea of how a Linux syscall is actually implemented in Go in the century. So GVisor actually has a few different methods of intercepting syscalls and handling user faults. We call each of these platforms internally. Ptrace used to be the default platform since it was the easiest to use on the widest set of environments, uh, but it had some uh, performance issues. Uh, we've since replaced Ptrace uh, as a default platform in favor of SysTrap since it is roughly just as portable but 10 times faster in our benchmarks that just run simple syscalls and tight loops. So SysTrap works by utilizing a kernel seccomp feature uh, called seccomp ret trap on a parent stub thread that we call sysmessage. Sysmessage's only purpose is to facilitate switching between the guest, kernel, sentry, all of which are hopefully familiar at this point. And all these guest threads are uh, children of the sysmessage parent thread. So installing this seccomp ret trap filter tells the kernel on all guest syscalls, raise a sig sys signal to the sysmessage thread with its configured handler. So when the application, the guest, or the application calls a syscall called like mount, for example, the kernel raises that signal and populates a signal handling data structure with all the guest state, including registers, SAC pointers, all that stuff that's going to contain the syscall and all its syscall arguments. So the signal handler um, in sysmessage actually shares a memory region with the sentry process, which enables it to uh, easily pass the sentry, the syscall arguments, from, from the guest. So the sentry gets the syscall uh, arguments and calls syscall, do syscall. Um, it implements, in this case, uh, all the logic that, for mount, and then returns, you know, if it was successful, probably zero, right, success. And then back in sysmessage, we restore, uh, put all that information returned from the uh, sentry, so success uh, return value, um, where to jump back to in the guest, and uh, put it all in this RT sig return struct, and then just yield back to the kernel. Kernel looks at that RT sig return struct and then restores back to the guest. And from the guest perspective, it's as if it was just handled in the kernel normally. That's a lot of information. Hopefully, you got it. <laughs> OK, so now I want to uh, talk about how the, the fun part of the story, you know, how these syscalls are actually implemented in the century in Go. So in the next few slides, I'm going to take you through a tour of some uh, GVisor code to see how a mount system call is handled internally. If you're not familiar, I imagine most of you will be, mount system call uh, just allows the user to attach a file system at a new location in the directory tree. Um, just a warning, there's a bunch of code in the next few slides. You're not expected to read it all. It's all very abbreviated. But I just want to paint a general picture of what the system call handling code path looks like. I've highlighted the most relevant uh, parts in red boxes. So worst case, just look at that. Um, so first, we have what's basically the entry point to the sentry after passing through some basic uh, safety checks. It's called execute syscall. There's some tooling around tracing you can see there, but the most important part to focus on is that it grabs a syscall handler from a predefined lookup table and executes um, if we have a corresponding uh, implementation. In this case, it's mount, so we do. Uh, for reference, here's what one of those syscall tables looks like. Uh, this one's for AMD64. Uh, each architecture has a slightly different syscall table, but and here's our mount system call uh, there in the corresponding function handler. So you see the handler we saw in the previous slide. And you see at the beginning, we uh, bail out if uh, we don't have the required uh, capsys admin capabilities with eperm. Same way Linux would. Uh, we want to just completely emulate exactly what Linux is going to do. And uh, we should copy in the source string from the guest address space into the sentry address space so we can handle it internally. Then finally, we call into our uh, virtual file system implementation to actually set up the mount and track it internally. Uh, Linux has a very similar BFS abstraction. So here we are in the actual VFS subsystem. This is where the work gets done. This code is super abbreviated, so it can fit in this slide. But really, the point here of showing this is that we're just really doing normal 
modifying the state of internal data structures type stuff here to set up the new mount. We're not touching the host at all. This is all handled inside the application kernel. There's no magic other than that. Uh, all of this code is available for you to play around with in our GitHub. Contributions welcome. Please help us cover more of the syscall surface. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so now that we have somewhat of an idea of how sandboxing works internally, uh, let's shift gears again and look at a couple different uh, scenarios and evaluate how sandboxing might help us or whether it's use, uh, worth using at all given the trade-offs we discussed a bit earlier. So let's say you're building an LLM chat app that allows users to ask a language model to generate and execute code. So you could say, language model, write me some Python to generate the nth number in the Fibonacci sequence and execute it for n equals 2,000. So do we need sandboxing? Is this a situation where the cost of sandboxing, increased resource use, maybe decreased performance, are going to be worth it? What do you all think? Security conference, probably, yes. <laughs> so I think, yeah, the threat is pretty obvious here. We're basically running untrusted code uh, on our own uh, systems. Um, so a malicious user could get the language model to generate some sneaky script that escapes the container, uh, or maybe the language model um, becomes sentient and decides it hates us, right? Uh, either way, we would like some, some le level of defense here. Uh, we should also be sort of thinking, uh, if we're thinking about sandboxing, think about the kind of environment we're running in, whether we have to use, uh, have access to nested virtualization, whether we have to use it or have bare metal machines. Um, in this case, it's hard to say that the situation's sort of vague, but uh, we're probably running in some VM or more likely a, a pod or, or on some uh, Kubernetes node. Uh, nested VMs maybe, but it's hard to say, hard to assume anything. Uh, another thing important to consider is like the kind of work that's being done. So is it gonna be very IO and disk heavy or networking IO heavy? Is it gonna be more, something more CPU bound like video encoding? Uh, again, it's, it's hard to limit because it's so open-ended, but it's probably not gonna be used for like uh, long running workloads or you know, production systems. I imagine it's gonna be people sort of individually asking this language model to generate short scripts or, or do some sort of useful um, analyzing CSV data kind of thing. Um, and finally, we want to think about the uh, lifetime of these uh, containers and where we can afford to take on that extra overhead. So in this case, you know, you're going to get a request, maybe spin up um, a container to handle uh, uh, executing this code, and then destroy it all. So startup latency per container overhead are going to be huge factors that we want to think about. Uh, we want to minimize resources spent on things that aren't doing anything useful for our end users. So again, probably an application kernel approach, GVisor is probably a good solution here, uh, probably the best fit. And it turns out that uh, you know, the big kids in the real world uh, <laughs> thought the same thing. So you can see um, we're gonna prove that GVisor, people use this in the real world actually. <laughs> so those are uh, GVisor D message messages, and this was uh, super fun to find out uh, the team, it was a surprise to the team. We just were playing around and was like, oh, I think, I think ChatGPT is executing code using GVisor. So super cool. So one more scenario. Um, imagine you're uh, offering a service to medical providers where they can upload medical images and notes and run it through some sort of multimodal model and give you a diag a diagnosis. And you've, you've trained this model using TensorFlow uh, every time someone uploads some data, you run inference against this model using TensorFlow as well. Um, any issues with that? Well, here's an issue. You're handling sensitive medical data. It's really important to have our security story dialed in. How are we gonna protect against vulnerabilities in our runtime? Sandboxing could be useful here. So we'll run through the same exercise as before quickly. The landscape we've discussed, some sort of vulnerability in PyTorch, JAX, TensorFlow. Um, that's gonna expose your containers to risk. What environment are you running in? Uh, we're probably running in, like, doing inference, running powerful uh, servers connected to beefy GPUs. Uh, we'll be looking to uh, minimize runtime overhead. Uh, what are these uh, containers gonna be doing? Well, they're going to be spinning up again, handling these requests, maybe you tear them down. Um, per container overhead and startup latency could be important considerations. What kind of work are we gonna, gonna be doing? Uh, probably a lot of DMA, a lot of allocating memory, um, moving that memory from host to GPU, from GPU back to host, spinning, waiting for the GPU to do some real work, and then just returning that result. So 
given the GPU does the bulk of the work here, we really want to minimize what we're doing in the CPU side and the host kernel. Uh, again, I think application kernel is a, is a good um, approach here. The problem is GVisor, as it's implemented today, or as it was implemented, doesn't really have a device model. You know, it doesn't have uh, driver code for your bl favorite Bluetooth mouse. Well, that is until recently, as of the last year, we've introduced GPU access from inside the sandbox. It's officially supported with a uh, feature that we called NV proxy. And the way this works, I've sort of overlaid it on our uh, old diagram there. But I'll go into a little bit of how uh, GPUs work themselves. So GPUs, basically, they have two components that make them work, a user space driver and a kernel space driver. Uh, the user space driver, for the purposes of this presentation, you can think of as basically just like libcuda.so, uh, uh, if you're familiar. Um, and, the, and libcuda translates your user space CUDA code into uh, syscalls called ioctals and issues those to the host uh, kernel space driver. The kernel space driver takes those ioctals and then translates that into you know, hardware instructions and kernel space, et cetera. Uh, so NVProxy doesn't really do much more than just intercept those ioctals using the same method we discussed before, um, and then you know, forwards those to the Sentry. Sentry does some translation work and then issues those same ioctals uh, through the setcom filters, which are adjusted uh, when NVProxy is enabled, uh, to, the, to the host kernel. And so you know, in, inside the Sentry, it just translates some file descriptors, remaps some memory, so it's all continuous in the Sentry address space. And so from the uh, kernel mode driver's perspective, it, uh, GPU commands are just coming from this, this Sentry process. But really, it's on behalf of this, this guest. And we found this approach is uh, really effective. Uh, we were really able to quickly build out compatibility with all of contain, uh, NVIDIA's container tooling. And our benchmarks so uh, negligible overhead when compared to uh, unsandboxed C GPU. So you can see we've got uh, tokens per second and model size scales well over time. But I also think uh, it's important to sort of discuss the limitations here. What you're getting in terms of protection is not exactly the same as our uh, regular two layers of fence in the, in, the, in the kernel side. We still have to rely on uh, NVIDIA's kernel mode driver, which is running in kernel space, closed source. It's a big piece of code that's going to have security bugs. Uh, we're also at the mercy of driver updates. This API between user space and kernel space is not stable. So we, the way we handle this internally is we have a rolling window of supported GPU driver versions that we've tested, um, but the interface can change under our feet at any time. And this also means that keeping NVProxy working is generally a continuous effort. Again, the challenge is that we don't really have uh, control of this part of the software. With that being said, this is still, I think, very useful. Generally, there are still tons of host uh, system vulnerabilities that we're going to, you know, in those like machine learning training libraries and such that we're going to want to protect against. Um, and we still do offer a good level of protection against GPU vulnerabilities. If we don't build out that uh, syscall translation layer in the Sentry and we don't add those syscalls to the setcom filters, uh, they're going to not be allowed to be issued to the host kernel. So we reduce the uh, attack surface of the uh, NVIDIA kernel mode driver uh, significantly. And if we look back at the past several years, uh, most CVEs, actually more than 50%, are, um, uh, were mitigated by GVisor just by this reducing this attack surface uh, approach. Every le le level of protection is, is important. Uh, if we can get there marginally um, with things like running in the host kernel. So we think this NVProxy stuff is really exciting. Uh, it's all available in open source. We have some great collaborators who are already building on top of it. And they're giving us great feedback. And we think there's a lot of cool opportunities here. You know, um, you might be able to schedule more, pod, uh, more pods on a single node uh, with this sandboxing because you have more confidence in, in the isolation, right? Uh, you may be able to more confidently serve untrusted models because people upload models and uh, do inference. There's also a uh, GVisor uh, checkpoint restore is something that works similar to uh, Creu. Basically, it just saves the, uh, all the state of the sentry and the application. Uh, to an image file and allows you to restore from this image. Uh, NVIDIA also has a tool called CUDA Checkpoint. And when you combine these together, you ha suddenly have uh, super easily checkpointable and restorable uh, GPU containers. And so this is something we're just beginning to play around with, but we think it's got a lot of uh, cool potential. Um, you, know, you may be able to save one uh, container and restore on 1,000, or do something like um, fast rewind or uh, experimentation where you checkpoint on a training and then um, rewind, uh, restore to an earlier state, and uh, try different experiments that way. 
So again, we're just, we're just playing around with this now, but uh, we think there's a lot of cool potential here. And then finally, you could also build out like a defense in depth solution for, for uh, GPU containers. So you know, tracking IOCTL, seeing what arguments are passed with them, seeing um, maybe you can set up some alerting on, on what you expect to be a GPU container to be doing and what IOCTLs it's issuing. Um, again, lots of possibilities here. So that's it for me. Again, I would just want to uh, plug uh, gvisor.dev is our website. It's got all this information and more. And um, we love external contributions. We love contributing to open source. And uh, that's it for me. Thanks. Yeah. I'm curious about how you think about WebAssembly mm. uh, with your sandbox approach. Yeah. Um, so could you, could you, so you asked about WebAssembly and how, how we think of it. Could you be a little bit more specific? What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's, it's just another method for, you know, isolating mm -hmm. and doing the, you know, sandbox isolation. And I don't know if it has any relevance with you guys, mm -hmm. but uh, just curious what your perspective is on that. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with uh, uh, WebAssembly, like, completely. I know generally it can be used as a sandbox. I think. What's great about GVisor is that, um, first of all, it's, it's got this, like, or what we aim for is this um, full ABI compatibility and um, with, with unmodified binaries, right? So you don't have to change anything about how you're compiling or uh, um, setting up your environment. You can just take your binary that you're usually running in run C and just run it in run SC, which is uh, how our GVisor containers are spawned. Um, Hopefully that answers. Yeah, Brian. Are you working on the roadmap for confidence interviews? Uh, is there any hardware that's like working on that? Yeah. Um, quick answer is no. Um, it's certainly something that's been experimented with in the past. Um, again, those kind of environments uh, have like um, their, the, their integration with that, that platform side, remember I, I, I mentioned SysTrap, right? Handling those user faults um, and redirecting the syscalls becomes uh, much more complex in that uh, uh, confidential, untrusted environment, right? Mapping that memory um, and moving that around is complex. Definitely something uh, that's been played around with, but there's nothing on the roadmap in the future right now. What is on the GVisor roadmap? Is it going to take over the mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I think um, we're really looking uh, heavily at this uh, checkpoint restore uh, features, right? So saving the container state and restoring. Again, I think that's, that's where we can really lean into the uh, advantages of GVisor, where starting up, from, uh, starting up the new GVisor process is super quick compared to other sandboxing solutions. So um, it also, the checkpoint restore is great because it, it works really well. Uh, if you're, any of you are familiar with Creu, is another, uh, solution for checkpoint restore uh, in user space. Uh, that's just with a regular kernel. But there's uh, big feature gaps. The great thing about GVisor checkpoint restore is we control the whole code base so we can really make sure it works in the important areas that it needs to work uh, for you know, restoring networking and things like that. Um, yeah, so the checkpoint restore and uh, just building out this NV proxy to be more and more useful for, for whoever wants to use it. Because again, the number one demand is just running untrusted uh, workloads with this AI, you know, GPU component to them. What have been some vulnerabilities that you found uh, in GVisor? Have there been G uh, vulnerabilities you've had to uh, remediate? Yeah, so I, I mentioned uh, almost all of the pod to guest escalations were, were um, mitigated by GVisor. Uh, of course, I think, so one that we couldn't mitigate against was like uh, any sort of speculative execution based attacks, right? That's at the CPU uh, layer. So that's just like a layer below where we provide uh, our defense and there's nothing we can do um, really there. But, and then there was one other um, that was about uh, like how we set up sort of sim links in the initial uh, container and it was a vulnerability in run C, 
And then uh, we were doing what RunC was doing, and so we were also found to be vulnerable. It wasn't anything to do with like our two layers of defense approach. It was more about how we were setting up like that initial truth and things like that. So that was another one we didn't uh, protect against. Yeah, those are the two that I know come to mind, and I'm pretty sure they're the only two in the past uh, at least five years. Uh, if no one has any more questions, uh, thanks for being a great audience. <laughs>